Welcome back. As many of you will know already, my life as a farm vet is pretty varied. So sometimes it's emergency work, like going and carving a cow. Other times it's more preventative. So that would include things like trace element testing. The reason for that is we're trying to scan the horizon for things that might not be an issue now, but could become issues in the near future. So we can correct them for those animals before they become serious. And today's job is just one of them. I'm going to collect some samples from a herd of dairy cows. And I'm gonna collect two types of samples. So number one, it's going to be blood. You've seen me do that loads of times before. Now, number two is slightly more complicated. It's a liver sample. Now it's fairly easy to collect a piece of liver from an animal that's already died, but getting a liver biopsy, that is a sample out of a living, breathing cow that's standing in front of you, is quite a different thing. And now this isn't ever something I've done in the UK. It's something I've only picked up since being here in New Zealand. Hopefully I'll get the chance to do it back at home now I've learned how to do it. But how do vets do it? And why are we collecting the samples in the first place? Those are two very good questions. Stay tuned to find out. So here are the girls lined up for me. I'm looking for two mature cows and two heifers. To save time, I'll prep all of them at the same time and hopefully collect each liver sample quickfire one after the other. Note that this is not an instructional video on how to do a liver biopsy. Remember, this is 100% a vet only procedure all day long. And if you are a vet, don't be a tight ass, go and get some proper CPD. But I will give you a rough rundown of what I'm doing. The first step is to clip a small patch of hair using the rib spaces to orientate myself, which I did before I got the GoPro rolling. Then the skin is prepped with a disinfectant. I've gotten into the habit of using these Hibby Scrub Soak swabs. They're pretty handy to keep in the car. After that, the cows get an injection of local anesthetic to numb the incision site. This little prick should be the most painful part of the entire procedure. Okay, nobody likes a little prick, but you'll see why it's necessary in a few minutes. While the local anaesthetic gets to work, I get my blood samples. As you've probably seen before, if you watch these vlogs, the vein of choice is the tail vein. So there's a little bit of monkeying around over the race to get a decent hold of those tails and a decent sample. After getting those bloods, I change my gloves again and get my kit ready. Now, this is a farmyard procedure. To pretend it's going to be 100% sterile is going to be fantasy. But by aiming for that, we keep the contamination and therefore any complication rate to an absolute minimum. Without wanting to tempt fate, I haven't had any issues post biopsy with cows and nor have I seen or heard of any of my colleagues having done so. As for the kit itself, it's fairly simple. Not many instruments needed and I'll walk you through each of these once we're done. You'll also spot my state-of-the-art surgical table which started life as a box full of intramammary drugs. A final skin wipe followed by a spray of some surgical spirit means the first cow is good to go. You can see a bit more clearly here where I'm aiming, on the cow's right hand side between her second and third rearmost ribs at about 45 degrees to the short ribs. I'm prepping these cows all at once, but I do check them just before each gets its biopsy done to make sure there's been no contact on other cows and I can re-prep them if that's the case. The scalpel blade gets me through the toughest part of the cow, the skin, which is as tough as old boots because it's made of the same stuff. After that, I use the biopsy needle to pass through the body wall and into the abdomen where the liver is. Once in, there's a bit of redirection to find the liver, a few passes in and out to collect a sample within that tube and then back out. Thankfully, the liver is one of the biggest organs of the body, so it's normally pretty easy to find. It's also an incredibly resilient and regenerative organ. Think about what a beating it can take over the course of a weekend. So it recovers and regrows nicely following this small trauma. There's no stitching up of the wound. That heals nicely by itself. It's less than a centimeter long. I'll explain what the syringe is for in a little while. Now, there are very few pain receptors in the abdomen itself. That's the reason we're able to rummage around when we're doing a cesarean section without the cow going nuts. And the local anesthetic has blocked the sensation to the skin and the muscle. So although at first glance, it looks like it must hurt. In fact, the cow might feel an odd movement but it shouldn't be painful at all. Once the liver is collected, I can empty it onto a swab and then package it up into a blood tube. And that's pretty much it. Like I said, there's no suturing up the small wound we make that heals nicely on its own. The cows get no antibiotics because we've been as clean as possible, except for a little bit of topical antibiotic spray. Just another three to go. 
While we're waiting, if this is your first time to the channel, don't be shy. Click that subscribe button so you don't miss more vlogs like these. You can also help me hit my 10k target by the end of the year. So apologies, I probably haven't been very talkative because I've just been getting on with it. Hopefully I've come up with a good uh, voiceover for you. So that's it, those last bloods got, that's eight bloods taken and four liver biopsies. I'm gonna go over what we're gonna do with them very shortly. I've actually got to just get washed up, go to another one of these and then go back to the practice and get those samples processed. But that won't be long. First things first, get washed up. I just want to show you the kit. So, let's try that. So, first things first. Very simple, scalpel blade. That's our slightly violent sounding stab incision just to get us through the skin. And then we have the liver biopsy needle, which is obviously very dirty now. I'm not gonna use it again today, so, well, before it's sterilized, so I can touch this as much as we like. So you can see, it's actually two parts. So there's the, just a the straightforward tube. You're not gonna be able to see down that, but that's just a tube. And then we've got the needle part. I always get confused, trocar, cannula. Whether this one's a trocar, this one's a cannula, the other way around, both or neither. Anyway, this is the liver biopsy needle. You can see, so initially we use this with the needle through the tube and the pointy end is what gets us through the body wall. We've already gone through the skin with a stab incision. The pointy end is what gets us through the body wall into the abdomen and then you withdraw the spiky bit because we're done with that. That is where I was using my five mil syringe. And that fits nicely on the end. The reason I'm using that is to apply a bit of negative pressure. Then I redirect from around perpendicular with the long axis of the cow towards her contralateral elbow, the elbow on the other side, up and down a few times, keeping the negative pressure on. Withdraw, keep it up so you don't lose anything good in that tube. And then onto the swab. That helps just have something clean for it to land on, but also drains away the blood because we don't want too much blood contamination that may affect our results. And that's it. Like I say, we'll go over what we're gonna do with the results very shortly. I just need to get washed up. I've got another one of these to go to now. If you've been watching some of these New Zealand vlogs, you're probably starting to get the picture. There's lots of jobs of the same kind all at once for about six weeks and then we're on to the next thing. So we did three of these yesterday, got two today. That's just me, everyone else has got their own on as well. It means there's lots of fighting over the kits. I'll get this washed up, I'll do my next job. We'll magic forward to the practice where I talk you through what I'm gonna send these off for and some results. Just before we go, you can see these girls are in sort of tremendous form. So really good body condition for this time of year. Coming towards the end of lactation. It's a mix of heifers and cows in here. That typical Kiwi type. There's actually not many brown ones in here, not any brown ones in here, but just smaller than you expect to see in the UK or in the US, say for example. Nice spotty one there. Um, and you can see, like there's one I've biopsied, maybe you can see that. Got a tiny little hole with a little bit of blue spray and a little bit of blood around it. There's one there as well, there's one there as well. I think it's a really interesting question to ask, look how painful, how uncomfortable is it for the animal? I hope they've covered that in the voiceover, but when I look at them here, yes, cows are prey animals. They're not designed to show pain, but I just don't think even so, there's any discomfort in these cows. The way they're sort of moving around, the way they're behaving, just, you know, their ears aren't down, they're looking at their bright. I don't think there's any significant pain there. So I'm confident that it's a good trade-off for animal welfare. You know, getting the trace element status right clearly is a different kettle of fish to having a wound, but I think for the degree of wound we've given them, sort of surgical wound, and it versus the information hell I can get and therefore make decisions about the whole herd, things that are gonna help not only her and their production and their performance, but their health and welfare as well and the health and welfare of their calves. I think that's a good trade-off, personally. If you think differently, don't hold back, do say, but um, that's my thoughts on it at the moment anyway. The other thing is, some of you might have noticed those orange tags in their right ear, ears. 
if any of you know what those are, let me know. Right, should get off to that other job. Okay, confession time, I just can't lie to you guys. I never got organized enough to do this on the day, but better late than never, I'll show you what some results look like. Those samples only went away a few days ago, so I haven't got those results, but just like Blue Peter, here are some I prepared earlier. This is a screenshot of what we, the vets, get back from the lab. In this case, the lab is Gribbles up in Dunedin, who actually have been really quick at turning around samples. So remember, I took eight bloods and four livers. We're testing three components here today. One is magnesium, we test all eight samples for that. Uh, serum selenium, for which we test six samples, so three cows, three heifers, and liver copper, for which we test those four liver biopsies, two of which were from heifers and two of which were from cows. So these numbers are deemed a representative sample. Don't ask me how that's calculated. Someone very clever will have worked that out a little while ago. So if you think we could have tested one cow, there's always a risk there that we're not that confident she's representative of the whole herd. Equally, we could have tested every cow in the herd, but there we start to add a lot of cost, a lot of time to the whole procedure. The idea is these numbers are the best compromise for picking up clinically relevant deficiencies or toxicities. So back to the table. As I said before, this is not an instructional video on how to do a liver biopsy or how to interpret the results. That's because there are so many different factors at play current supplementation, historical results, what's happening to these cows over the winter. This is just to illustrate what we get back from the lab. And this is a nice, simple one. There's a reason I've picked these results. It's because they're good. In fact, they're excellent. And this, like everything, no doubt will change in the future as our understanding of these things progresses. We want serum selenium at about 800 to 1500. Magnesium just within the range given here. And liver copper probably upwards of 800 but not into the high 2000s as then we're starting to approach too much copper. The risk there being copper poisoning. And you will have realized looking at the lower ends of the ranges here given by the lab as what they call an adequate range, the numbers I've given are a lot higher and that's probably because the lab is talking about clinical deficiency. So that's where things get so low you see obvious clinical signs. With something like selenium you might see white muscle disease, retained placenta, things like that. So if these cows had, say, a serum selenium of 200, they wouldn't technically be clinically deficient, but they'd be in that grey marginal area where they would probably still benefit from some sort of supplementation with regards to their health, their fertility and performance. So by my reading of these results, they're pretty damn good. And in fact, another great aspect of them is that they are very consistent. There's no wayward animals here and there's no big differences between heifers and cows. And that's important to check because if we just look at averages, right, averages can mask a lot of variation. The other cool thing about this report is that it shows us how this farm compares to other farms who are doing the same tests and also how they fluctuated over time. So this is the liver copper, probably the most interesting one. You can see here that there's an overall trend for copper levels to rise. That's from about December to May or June, i.e. when cows are dried off. I believe, but don't hold me to it, that the shaded area is the range. You can see some results are way beyond that 3000 safe upper boundary. This is the pre-carving trace element check for this herd, and there's the pre-dryer result, i.e. the one we're looking at now. So you can see it's followed the general trend. Why does this occur? Probably because cows are being supplemented more with copper when they're being milked, either through the uh, in-water minerals, through something called a dositron, or in in-feed minerals. So that copper, whether it's coming from palm kernel or in water supplementation or some other source, if it's above requirement, that can accumulate in the liver. And that's why I think we tend to see this accumulation of copper, that upward swing as the milking season progresses. Anyway, I could go into heaps more detail here, probably have gone into too much detail already, so apologies. But some of you did enjoy that video we did with Chris over at Wingate's back in Northumberland where we were looking at those lambs which had a number of different deficiencies that were stopping them growing. So this is a sort of similar video, um, just showing you how to collect some samples and then very, very roughly what we're doing with interpretation. If you haven't seen that video and you want to see it, it'll be here. Otherwise, if you've made it this far and you haven't already subscribed, go ahead, click that subscribe button, ring the little bell next to it, Give the video a thumbs up 
and leave me a comment. Have you ever tested your cows for copper before? Are you a UK vet who is doing liver biopsies? That would also be very interesting to know. Anyway, that's enough for now. I will see you for the next one.